Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Please turn in your Bibles to the 18th chapter of the book of John. John, the 18th chapter. Cody read for us a few minutes ago an occasion in which we see Jesus before Pilate. And upon being questioned, he emphasizes the fact that he says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting, that I wouldn't be delivered to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from hence. Here we see Jesus as a king. We understand that from a reading of the Gospels. And as members of the Lord's kingdom, we understand that he's the king that we serve. We also need to understand, though, that this is a spiritual kingdom. And while there are many different kingdoms and nations in the world, there are really only two kingdoms in the spiritual realm. Jesus' kingdom, which was prophesied in the Old Testament. You remember in the second chapter of the book of Daniel, where Daniel, as he is interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the great image before him, with different metals that were part of its body. And finally, when it talks about the, the feet uh, of this image that he saw, he describes a fourth kingdom. And he says that in the days of those kings, God will set up a nation, a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And we see that being fulfilled in the Lord's church, his kingdom. We see also in the New Testament, it's a theme that is picked up, in which you remember in the first chapter of the book of Colossians, in verse 13, there the apostle Paul says, For he, Christ, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of God's dear Son. So we do see Jesus with a kingdom, but there are only two kingdoms, and there is another one that is competing. You remember in Matthew, the 12th chapter, and verse, verse 22 beginning. Please turn over there if you would, please. Matthew 12, beginning in verse 22. There we see as Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God, he's been challenged for the reason that he has been doing uh, miracles. And some have accused him of doing miracles by satanic powers. Here in verse 22 of chapter 12, beginning through verse 26, there we see Jesus emphasizing the fact that the kingdom, as he's describing it, of Satan is not one that is divided. He says in verse 22, When then a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus, and he healed him so that the mute man spoke and saw. And the crowds were amazed and were saying, This man cannot be the son of David, can he? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This man casts out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and any city or house divided against itself will not stand. Jesus said that first, not Abraham Lincoln. If Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? So here we see the kingdom of Satan described, and it is one of only two possibilities, that everybody on the planet who's ever lived has either been a member of the kingdom of Christ or the kingdom of Satan, one or the other. There are really only two choices. In the second chapter of the book of Ephesians, we see as it talks again about the the domain of Satan. It describes it in, in uh, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, as this way. It said, You who were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. So here, can you imagine being called the prince of the power of the air? Here Satan is indeed a king over his kingdom. His kingdom will not endure, but his kingdom is one that as far as our experience is concerned is one that is competing with the kingdom of Christ. We need to understand though that both of these kingdoms are aggressive in their efforts to convert people from the other one. Now, sometimes we're not as aggressive as we need to be in trying to make people delivered from the domain of darkness 
and into the kingdom of God's dear son. And that's why we need to be involved in evangelism. But we also need to understand Satan is competitive too. He wants to do what he can to try to bring people from the kingdom of God's dear son into his kingdom. And where do you think he is going to try to recruit? Does he have to recruit in the media? <laughs> Does he have to recruit in uh, academia? Does he have to recruit in all these other things that seem to be run by the, the prince of the power of the air? No. He has to try to compete in the church of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God's dear son. So he doesn't have to worry about these people out here who, who he already has. He has to worry about you. And it's important that we understand. You know, if somebody's trying to be a recruiter for the Marine Corps, he doesn't recruit at Paris Island. That's where Marines are. You don't have many people that you can recruit from there. They're already recruits. If Satan wants to recruit, he's working on the Lord's church. And we need to understand that and appreciate it. The principle uh, that I want to talk about this morning, and I, I named my lesson this, the, the mice principle, is a principle that I learned about from uh, an ex-KGB agent. The KGB was the secret police of the Soviet Union. And an ex-KGB agent said that all people who were trying to turn American spies from being loyal to the United States to being loyal to the Soviet Union understood the MICE principle. Actually, it's the M-I-C-E principle. And it stands for those things that were used to try to change somebody from being loyal to their government and their country and to become a defector or a traitor or a double agent for them. They stand for the letters in mice. My M is for money. I is for ideology. C is for compromise. And E is for ego. I want to talk about each four of those things this morning to let us understand that Satan is out for you. He's out for your children. And he wants to do everything he can to make you a double agent in the Lord's kingdom that's really not part of his kingdom but serving the kingdom of Satan. Let's look at each one of these four things and make application to our lives so that we don't fall under the trap of the mice principle. Um... Let's look at Matthew, the 19th chapter, first, to see a good biblical example of the problem of money. The 19th chapter of the book of Matthew, beginning in verse 16. Jesus is talking there to a man who we usually refer to as the rich young ruler. He is, beginning in verse 16, it says, Someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And he said to him, why are you asking me about what's good? There's only one who's good, and if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Then he said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I've kept, what am I still lacking? Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. What would we have done if we were in the same situation? I've often wondered about that myself, and I'm afraid I, times in my life I'd have failed the test. Can you imagine, here he tells a fellow who's used to being able to have some comfort in the fact that he has a measure of wealth, and then he tells him, walk off and leave it. Give it away. How comfortable would we be in giving it away? Can you think, now what would I do about insurance? How would I make my car payment? How would I be able to take care of my family? All questions that we see this man, I'm sure, going through in his mind, but Jesus, knowing his problem, says, give it all away and come follow me. 
and he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. You see, money can be a real agent by which Satan is able to get to us sometimes if we're not careful. You remember the story in the 12th chapter of the book of Luke about the rich fool? He's described uh, and in context of a man who had come to Jesus asking him a question that would seem to be in some ways reasonable. He uh, asked Jesus to mediate between him and his brother over some property. Jesus, however, uses that as an opportunity to talk about the problem of wealth. He says in verse, uh, verse 16, beginning in chapter 12, he says, uh, he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my goods? And he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I'll store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, I think it's strange that he talks to his soul. So, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You see, the scriptures talk about the problem of wealth. You remember back in the story of the rich man, of the, the rich young ruler, we saw Jesus emphasizing how difficult it was for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. That doesn't mean that they can't, but he does describe the difficulties of it. The more we have, the more we have to manage. The more we have, the more we get used to it. The more independence we're able to have because of our wealth, the more we like that. Doesn't mean that your wealth can't be used in a good way. Doesn't mean that being rich is automatically something that Jesus doesn't like. It just means that it serves as an extra hazard that someone has in their spiritual growth and development, and one more thing Satan can use against you. And he used it against the rich young ruler, and he used it against the rich fool. There's a bulletin article that I read many, many years ago about a church, I think it was in Texas, in which they had discovered oil on the church property. And they had uh, some oil wells that were pumping uh, from there. And instead of deciding that they would give this money into the collection of the church, they decided that they would divide it up among the members. Guess what day had the greatest attendance at that congregation? The day they passed out the check. Do you think that really is part of this same principle? What would you do? Would you come to church more likely if we were giving $100 out to everybody who showed up? I think most people would. That's just the way it works. You know, we, if, if I had $100, I'd do it. Or, I, you know, I'm uh, not feeling very good today, but I sure need that $100. You see, think about that. Because that may be, be the very way that Satan uses to try to get you to not do what you're supposed to do. Would you not come to service if you were paid? I knew a lady many years ago who was uh, asked, she was a very good singer, and she was asked to uh, sing for the inauguration of ceremonies of a denominational church. And they offered her $500. It would require missing two Sunday services and three Wednesday night services. $100 a service. Could you be bought out of a congregation, out of serving the Lord, out of doing your duty to the Lord, if you were paid for? Heard a story many years ago about a man who was, uh, he was terrible. He was a lecher, but he was part of the Paris literary circle back in the uh, 125 years ago. He walked up to a woman one time at a party and asked her, said, uh, would, uh, would you commit a lewd act with me for a million pounds? 
she kind of smiled and giggled and said, yes, I probably would. And he said, would you do the same thing with me for five pounds? And she said, no, what kind of a woman do you think I am? And he said, we've established what kind of woman you are. We're just negotiating price. As vulgar as that idea is, do you realize that's what Satan does with us all the time? He's trying to figure out what kind of a man and what kind of a woman you are. And if he can get you to compromise with money, then all he has to do is negotiate the price down every time. He'll never pay you the same again. We need to understand it and realize that as Christians, we have the obligation that we must heed the admonition of Colossians, the third chapter in verse 1, and make sure that we don't allow anything to stand in our way of being able to serve the Lord and don't allow money to be the means by which Satan is able to use it as a tool against us. Ideology is also something that uh, is used. Very often you can have somebody who's not just bought or given money so that they'll betray their country, but sometimes somebody betrays their country because they were a Nazi or because they were a closet communist or something like that, and because of their ideology, they wind up betraying their country. You know, sometimes there are people in the Lord's Church who wind up being, because of patriotism, because of a strong sense of justice, because of uh, feminism, because of any type of ism that becomes more important to you than the Lord's service, wind up allowing this to serve as the means by which they fall away from serving the Lord and doing his will. Turn over to the book of Jonah, if you would, please. Because there in the book of Jonah, we see, I think, a good example of this very principle at work. Ideology was Jonah's particular problem. Look in the first three verses. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into it to go with him to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Why didn't Jonah, who was a prophet, want to do what God told him to do? Perhaps he knew what was going to happen in the future. Perhaps he knew that the Assyrians, whose capital was Nineveh, were the ones who were going to take the northern kingdom where he lived captive in the relatively near future. He doesn't want them to be saved. He wants them to be destroyed because he thinks in that they'll be the salvation of his northern kingdom. But God told him to go preach to Nineveh. And he doesn't want to do it. So he runs away from the Lord. In verses 9 through 12 of the same chapter, it says... Uh, as there's a great storm that comes out on the sea while he's there. He says, he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men became extremely frightened and they said to him, how could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So they said to him, what should we do with you that the sea may become calm for us? So the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea, then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that on account of me this great storm has come upon you. You see, he explains that he fears God, perhaps not as much as he should to be trying to run away from what God told him to do, but you see, he fears God. He's somebody who has some loyalty to the Lord, but yet not enough loyalty to do what the Lord told him to do. And his sense of patriotism is standing in the way of him being able to serve the Lord completely. In the third chapter of the book of Jonah, I want you to notice, it says, And the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim it to the proclamation I'm going to tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. Between 
the last reading that we had in this one, do you remember what happened? As he was thrown into the sea, a great fish got a hold of him and swallowed him. And he was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster. And under those circumstances, he decided to repent. And he prays to the Lord there, and the Lord has the fish vomit him out on the beach. I want you to notice when the Lord tells him the second time to go and preach to Nineveh, he doesn't let his shirt tail hit his back until he does it. In verse 4, it continues. Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. For he issued a proclamation, and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. But both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth and let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that he will not, we will not perish. See, he's a very effective preacher. He preaches to such an extent that even the king of Nineveh repents in sackcloth and he tells everybody, you even make your animals wear sackcloth. You don't eat anything. You don't drink anything. Maybe the Lord will change his mind. And the Lord does change his mind. The problem is it doesn't particularly satisfy Jonah. In verse chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, it says that it greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. What a baby. Can you imagine? Here's somebody, because of his sense of patriotism, his sense of loyalty to home and family, decides that he's going to stand up and be rebellious against the commands of the Lord, and even when he winds up doing it and successfully causes repentance among the Assyrians, he's sorry for it because he wanted them to be destroyed. Can you think of modern-day examples of that? You know, sometimes in the church, there are situations in which somebody's attitude or somebody's particular ideology stands in their way, of doing what God wanted them to do. Almost 200 years ago, there was a, a movement among churches of Christ to establish a missionary society to preach the gospel in foreign countries. Instead of looking to the New Testament pattern in which we see preachers supported by individual congregations, they thought it would be better to have a human institution with human rules, with human leaders, with human paid memberships from anybody, whether they were a New Testament Christian or not, to collect money to be able to go and preach the gospel in other places. There's nothing wrong with wanting to preach the gospel, nothing wrong with wanting to be a missionary. But the arrangement of the missionary society was such that it wasn't consistent with the plan that God had of the saved man teaching a lost man and saved men being supported to be able to preach the gospel to lost people in the world without a society. Ideology got in the way. And we need to make sure that it doesn't affect us. Have you ever known anybody in our time who because of their feminism wound up allowing that to get in their way of doing what God told them to do? Now take, don't get me wrong, I wouldn't call myself a feminist, but I think in the, in the 20th century, there probably wasn't any greater historic development than the elevation of women. You know, at the beginning of the 20th century, you had states where women couldn't really own property, where women were second-class citizens in everything in which they, their ability to vote was, uh, even back a little bit further, was compromised. And I think it's been great that women have been given a position of equality in our culture. 
But you know, when you have somebody who, because of their ideology, begins to think that the restraints that the Lord places on women in the New Testament don't count now in the 21st century, that's doing the same thing that Noah did. Thinking their way is better than the Lord's way, their ideology is better than the Lord's plan. And it's important for us to understand that and realize there are defections from the Lord's church because of that kind of ideology. Remember in the 1st Samuel, the 15th chapter, there Saul, who is king of the United Kingdom of Israel, the first king actually, he's told to go and utterly destroy the Amalekites. And he utterly destroys at least one major band of the Amalekites. It's, it's, he saves Agag, their king, and he saves the best of the flocks and the herds ostensibly to sacrifice to the Lord. We should understand later on, because David has to fight Amalekites, that he didn't do what he was supposed to do then. There were other Amalekite bands that he didn't take care of, but here he decides it's time to go to Carmel and establish a monument for himself and to go and when he meets Samuel, remember he says, Behold, I have obeyed the command of the Lord. And Samuel says, What then is the bleeding of the sheep and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Way too much livestock around here for you to have done what God told you to do. As he makes excuses, we see finally Samuel telling him to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of ram. The Lord likes sacrifice, right? But he wants obedience. He wants, he wants loyalty rather than those things. And if we allow our ideology to stand in the way of us being able to serve God completely, then we've made the same mistake as Saul, the same mistake as Job. C in our uh, the mice principle stands for compromise. And I think we see all kinds of situations in which Satan tries to get us to compromise. You remember, I think, when in the Garden of Eden, Satan didn't approach uh, Eve through the serpent with the idea of, listen, you need to just uh, completely reject God. He says, listen, has God told you that you can eat of all the fruits in the garden? And she says, no, we, we can't eat of all of them. We can eat of all of them except the tree in the middle of the garden. And God said we should neither eat it, and she says, nor touch it, lest we die. But Satan says, you shall not surely die. But the Lord knows that if you eat of it, you'll become like God, knowing good and evil. Compromise on what God has told you. She doesn't say reject God completely. He just said reject what God has said. Make that compromise. And she compromises it, and we continue to bear in our physical death and our physical ailments, the consequences of her bad decision. There was also a situation in 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter. Do you remember when David is in a situation where he compromises himself? Instead of being at the siege of Rabbah with his army, he stays in Jerusalem. One evening when he's out on his rooftop looking, he sees and from the place where his palace would have been in the modern city of Jerusalem. You can look down over the city of David portion of Jerusalem, which is kind of a, a hogback ridge. I'm sure that the Jews never called it a hogback ridge. But it was one with a ridge in the middle that went all the way down toward Ain Rogel. And you could have seen the rooftop of virtually every house in the city of David portion of Jerusalem. And there's a woman on a rooftop bathing. And instead of being a godly man and turning around and going back to his house, he looks and he inquires about who it is and finds out that it's, that it's one of his most trusted soldiers' wives. And he calls for her. He commits adultery with her. But when he finds out she's pregnant, he does everything to try to cover up his sin. And finally, when Uriah is more righteous than he and won't do anything to cover up David's sin, he, comp he, he compromises to such an extent that he is involved in conspiracy to allow Uriah to be killed in battle by the hands of the Ammon. 
You see, one thing led to another. And it finally comes to a situation in which David finally is one who is told that the sword will never depart from your house. You've given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. How many times through our compromises do we listen to the incitements of the world and uh, give reasons for the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme? I think one of the easiest situations you can find in reference to compromise is in reference to a lie. Have you ever lied and then wind up having to tell a whole bunch of other lies just to cover up what you lied? Your David thinks, as king, it's not going to be any problem if I commit adultery. I've got a bunch of wives anyway. Uh, all kings commit adultery, he thought, I'm sure. But you see, the problem was he was a ruler over God's people, and God wasn't going to tolerate that for we need to understand that if we're going to live lives that are pleasing to the Lord, we can't allow ourselves to fall into the trap of doing something different that, than God would have us to do. You remember the 26th chapter of the book of Matthew? We see Peter denying three times that he even knows the Lord before the enemies of the Lord. You know one of the reasons he did that? It's because he put himself in a compromising situation. He was surrounded by people who didn't love the Lord. You surround yourself, especially young people, with people who don't love the Lord, you're putting yourself in a situation where if you're surrounded by people that have no fear of God, before you know it, you're going to do things wrong. In 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, in verse 33, Jesus, uh, Paul, winds up quoting the Greek comedian, Menander, when he says, Be not deceived, Evil companions corrupt good morals. And they do that by causing compromise to come up with us. When you see the Lord, or the Lord's church, or the Lord's people criticized and spoken against in a way that's disrespectful and unreasonable, do you stand up for the Lord? Or do you just allow it to go? Peter just thought he'd let it go, and it winds up being something that served as a scar on his life and a, and a taint to his reputation. The final thing in the mice principle is E, and that's ego. And I think what that does is that any situation in which we are challenged by flattery or an appeal to who we are to do the things that are wrong. You know, uh, Satan appeals to Jesus' pride you remember how he did that? You don't look like anything to me, but if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Jesus doesn't do that. He says, if you're the son of God, cast yourself down off this, because surely you wouldn't be afraid to cast yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple if you are the son of God. He dares. You ever been dared into doing something wrong? And then finally, there's no doubt about who Jesus is. He says, fall down and worship me, and I'll give you the whole world. See, we need to understand that ego and our idea of being able to be flattered into doing something wrong is what stands against us. We can allow ourselves to be flattered into it. Very often, Russian agents would try to appeal to somebody who was a misfit and try to make them feel they'd have a sense of importance as a double agent, they wound up compromising and wound up allowing their ego to be the very thing that ruined them. You know, that's one of, one of the problems sometimes that exists with a secular education. It can sometimes make somebody too proud for God. It can make somebody think that they know much more than what they ought to know. Stay under the name of saying, listen, I, I believe in science. It winds up really being they believe in scientists rather than they believe in science. And we need to recognize that if we allow secular humanism, if we allow any kind of academic pride to stand in our way of being able to serve God and serve Him completely with this ancient message that we have in the New Testament to do what God would have us to do, we've fallen to the mice principle. And if we're not careful, 
we can wind up being somebody who winds up being a double agent rather than someone who serves God with a whole heart. In 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, in verse 9, there we see the Apostle Peter as he emphasizes the seriousness of the conflict that we're in. Tells the, the brethren that are scattered across Asia Minor the things that we need to understand also about our conflict with Satan. In verse 9 he says, But resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. The only way that Satan is going to be able to be thwarted in his efforts to cause us to be double agents is to resist him. That's his weakness. He doesn't do well with resistance. You remember when Jesus past the tests of the three, uh, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of love in the wilderness. Satan went away until an opportune time. You resist Satan, and you can defeat him. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. What about you this morning? Are you someone who's a member of the Lord's kingdom, or are you a member of the kingdom of Satan? That's pretty easy to determine according to the New Testament because there's only two choices. And unless you're a member of the church that we see read, that we read about in the New Testament, you are not a member of the Lord's kingdom. If you'd like to solve that particular problem through faith, you can believe in Jesus Christ and on the basis of that faith, repent of the things you've done that are wrong, confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and be baptized so your sins can all be washed away. And we can do that for you this morning. If you are a child of God, but your loyalty has become questionable because of your own actions, because you've fallen to one of the principles that are articulated in the MICE principle, you need to come to a recognition that that's wrong and to do the things that God would have you to do and stand firm against the devil and resist him at all times, at all possible. Think about these things, and if we can help anyone in their obedience to the Lord this morning.